Good morning, my name is Sally Gunning. I'm president of the Brewster Historical Society and I'd like you in to invite you today to visit the Cobb House Museum at 739 Lower Road, Brewster, Massachusetts. This is the Cobb House. It was built in 1799 by Elijah Cobb. He wrote a letter home to his family saying, my partner in life's voyage has put me in debt for a Cape Cod farm. And this is the Cape Cod farm that he was talking about. In 1860, there were 52 acres on the property. There were probably more when he first bought the property in 1799. He built the house and they moved in on New Year's Day, 1800. This anchor is called a diamond eye anchor. It was likely built in Gloucester, Massachusetts out of bog iron. It was a rust resistant type of iron. And this size anchor would have been used on a thousand pound ship probably very similar to the 1850s clipper ships that we feature in our museum here and so many Brewster shipmasters captained uh, back in the 1800s. The gardens at the Cobb House were designed after the gardens that were actually here in 1879. Caro Dugan, the great-granddaughter of Captain Elijah Cobb, kept a diary from 1875 to about 1879 and she documented everything that was growing around her. So we were able to use some of her notes in creating these gardens and some of the plants that you see in here were created actually out of heirloom seed. So we have two gardens. This one isn't quite come into its own yet. This is early spring that we're doing this recording. The snap peas in particular that are going to grow up on the uh, frame were made from special heirloom seed that dates them straight back to the 1800s. There's a second garden, we call it the sundial garden. All of the furnishings in the garden here are typical to what was mentioned in her diary and could have been found in the day. In this garden we have a Victorian era bird bath and over here we have a sundial. These are memorial benches that uh, donors have contributed to the garden and it makes it a beautiful reflection garden and people like to come here and just sit and reflect. This is the keeping room in the Cobb house and this is the room that was probably most used in the house. It was the heart of the home and it was really central to family life. Here would be the cooking, the cleaning, the uh, baking, textile manufacture. These are a couple of flax wheels. Uh, one of my favorite things in the room is the beehive oven. I'm going to open it and you can look in and you'll see right away why it was called a beehive oven. It's shaped just like a beehive. This was a pretty ingenious little creation. It was designed so that you would pile coals onto the bricks and let them sit there until it had heated and then scrape the bricks off and you'd start baking and you'd put in the things that needed the hottest heat and the longest time first like bread and then you'd go on to your puddings and your pies and your cakes. A pot of uh, baked beans would just sit there overnight in the residual heat. It was pretty nifty. There was of course the fireplace where you could do all your roasting and stews were big. Many things were stewed that you wouldn't want to stew today but they like to stew everything up. We have irons here demonstrating that um, all kinds of household activities were going on here. We have the butter churn and a washing dolly for use when they were doing the wash. This room was called the best parlor. We know it's the best parlor because up on top here you'll see something called dental molding. You can imagine this was expensive to make in the days before power tools. And this molding down here is called reed molding. To put both of these in a room made it special. When guests came, when the minister came, this is where they'd bring them. And when the room wasn't in use, they'd just push all the furniture back to the wall and there it sat. We've used this room to fill with everything to do with shipmasters. We have navigation tools they used portable desks. This is a first mate's desk that actually went to sea with them. You can imagine if you're at sea for a couple of years you would want to have a few of your comforts around you. The fireplace here is a Rumford fireplace. This was a hot new item in 1790. Uh, it was shallow. The old fireplaces were very deep and these are shallow and the walls are slanted so that the heat would be forced out into the room. And for Cobb to put this in in his house in 1799 was really up and coming. One of my favorite things in this room is this medicine chest that would have been on shipboard with the captain. And we had some fun researching the various medicines in the chest. We know what castor oil is and Epsom salt and so forth. But turkey rhubarb, we weren't sure what that was. And come to find out, it just meant that's how it got here. It came via turkey. We have a couple of new exhibits in this room this year, which are so much um, fun for everyone. 
Uh, we tried to honor the landing of the Mayflower in uh, 2020, uh, so we, we honored it in 2021 instead because we weren't open in 2020. This map shows you a breakout of 10 lots of land. The first four ships that arrived in America, the Mayflower, the Anne, the James, and the Fortune, brought settlers who had to do a lot of the grunt work in order to make this place livable. And in return for their extra contribution to the colony, they were granted lands. Those 10 lots were granted to passengers of those four ships. So we document them, we tell their biographical information here, and then you can cross over to the other wall and trace their name on the Mayflower Compact. Some of them are on the Mayflower Compact. This exhibit, of course, is very important to us. One, we weren't the first ones here, obviously. So the first comers, the native peoples, had populated this area for thousands upon thousands of years before we got here. And we're so honored to have this wonderful collection of artifacts uh, documenting their lives and the tools they used. We're very grateful to Chris Dudzik, one of our board members and manager of Windmill Village, because he loaned us the parts of these uh, collections for our museum. And over here we have an old desk from Brewster Post Office. On top of it we've added information about all the people who lived here, starting with Elijah Cobb all the way up to the Brewster Historical Society. But in between we've got some pretty fascinating characters. We have Cara Dugan, we've already talked about her diary. She was a wonderful photographer and we have over 400 glass plate negatives in our collection from around Brewster at the turn of the last century thanks to Caro. Another interesting occupant was Howard Gibbs. He was a name artist. His, his work has appeared in the Museum of Fine Arts and he did a great deal to restoring this house when he bought it in 1945. This door is original to the Cobb House as is the box lock. You'll wonder why they faced houses south, or if you don't wonder, I'm going to tell you anyway. Uh, on a warm day, you can feel the heat right through the door because this house faces dead south as most of the houses did. We have some photographs of the Cobb House in this corridor here, um, dating back to the late 1800s. Here is our exhibit on were there slaves in Brewster, and yes, there were. We have replicated the documents from our collection and from the state archives that indicate their presence here. A census from 1754 detailed 12 slaves in Brewster. This is a block front desk from the 1700s, and it was donated to the museum by the Clark family. Uh, it's considered one of the most valuable pieces in our collection. It's, it's featured in a catalog of the winter tour uh, museum. This is the family parlor and in this room people would have read, played games, chit-chatted, visited in a less formal setting than they would have done in the best parlor. Uh, in this room are a couple of things that are particularly interesting to me. This is a portrait of Eliza Emma Winslow. She married Captain Francis Foster. Uh, while Foster was engaged to Eliza, he, he traveled to China and he brought this photograph of Eliza with him and asked an artist to paint her portrait. The artist was happy to do so, but he really insisted on correcting the hair color. He didn't think that anybody looked right with that pale hair. Another favorite item of mine is this child tender. It's kind of a cross between a playpen and a high chair and they really needed it. One of the um, most frequent causes of death for children was fire. In this room, the family would have surrounded themselves with their treasures. In particular in Brewster, treasures from the China trade were very prominent. Most of these were donated from Brewster families that had had shipmasters in their family tree. A lot of the items you see in this shelf is from the China trade. This is a beautiful breakfast robe that my favorite Eliza Winslow wore. And we have all kinds of items in the uh, case here that were hand carved chess boards, cribbage boards, fans, beautiful things that were brought home from China. This camphor chess was brought for Mary Foster all the way from Hong Kong. Camphor chests were very popular items because the nature of the wood was such that it kept moths and other insects free from their woolen clothing. And there were many instances of camphor chests making their way back to Brewster. Here's a wonderful picture of the factory where they might have been making a camphor chest in China. 
As we walk up the stairs, you'll find a picture gallery on the walls, and some of them are portraits done by the itinerant artist named Giddings Ballou. An itinerant artist would often come and stay in your home for even six months at a time while he painted your family. So you'd have to be on pretty good terms by the time he got done. These are portraits Giddings Ballou did of the Bangs family, Desire and Nancy. Behind here we have Captain Freeman Bangs and his wife Susan. Over here we have Captain Benjamin Fessenden. A shipmaster, however, might have been almost more interested in a portrait of his ship. They'd pull into port and immediately commission an artist to paint their beautiful ships. Hopefully they could create them under full sail. These are some of our favorite portraits that we have in our collections. This is the Undaunted, and we are at some point going to be selling limited edition prints of this painting, so watch for that. That's going to be really special. This is the Kingfisher, and this is a clipper that was beating records all over the place. And this is one of the Fezzedin ships, the Bark, the Cater. Here also we have one of our favorite little exhibits, the Helen Keller exhibit. We were gifted a very unique photograph. It's the first photograph ever taken of Helen and Ann Sullivan, and it was taken right here in Brewster. And it's more interesting because Helen is holding a doll, and this was the first word that Ann Sullivan was able to teach Helen. Helen Keller stayed right here in Brewster and so on several different locations, and one of the photographers who boarded here, Cornelius Chennery, took this photograph. Uh, he boarded here at the Cobb House and became friends with Cara Dugan, some say a little more than friends and taught her photography. And we'll be talking a little, about more, a little bit more about that in a few minutes. In this display, we have samples of her writing. That's a beautiful little thank you note she wrote to um, Mr. Chenery and examples of how she would have written it. This is the master chamber upstairs in the Cobb House. And we know it was the master bedroom. They would call them chambers in those days because once again, we see the dental molding and they wouldn't bother to put that in if this wasn't the room for the head of the household. The showpiece in this room at the moment is the Nellie Dollhouse. This was built by Captain Josiah Knowles when he was at sea for many years with not much, too much to do. He even did the embroidery and some of the lace work on this dollhouse. He brought it home for his little daughter who was 20 months old when he left and she was about four by the time he returned. We have a separate video on our website of the dollhouse where you can actually look into all the rooms and see all the furnishings. He collected all these furnishings all over Europe and put them into the dollhouse and it's quite a work of art. Every latch on the door actually works. There are complete sets of china inside and I think you'll have a lot of fun looking in um, to Nellie's dollhouse on our website. Other items of interest in this room we tended to use this room to display a lot of our domestic belongings, things that would have been kept nearby in the bedroom part of the house. This is a wedding dress from 1888. It belonged to the Sears family, and we have the bride standing up there in the photograph in the dress in the back. You can imagine trying to fit your feet into those tiny little shoes or your waist into that tiny little dress. This is one of my favorite objects in the museum. This bed was made by a fellow named Warren Silver. He was actually shipwrecked off Nosset Beach as a baby and his parents lashed him to a piece of wood in hopes that they could save his life, which they did by doing that. He was rescued and adopted. He spent many years living with the Winslow family at what is High Brewster today. It was then the Winslow Farm. And for five generations of the family, he was an important member of the family. That doll is made uh, with a china head but stuffed body and that's real human hair. In addition to the dollhouse and some of the larger items in the room, we also have a nice collection of smaller items. We have shoe wear, which includes Roland Nickerson's Junior's boots, uh, a collection of hats and bonnets. We have some beautiful jewelry and hair combs and a wonderful collection of beaded bags. Over in this case up here, we have many interesting items that some came directly from the Cobb House. The wine glasses were Elijah Cobb's. We have beautiful examples of wallets that were used in the 18th century and personal items such as toothpicks, fans, and silhouettes. And another favorite item here is a silk fan with an ear trumpet. How to have it all. 
Before I leave the room, I have to talk about the door. We consulted with a historic preservationist when we were restoring the Cobb House, and he said, do not touch this door. It tells the whole story of the house. You can see that it was at one time painted. Someone, not us, tried to remove the paint once the paint was removed, they came down to another kind of a finish. It was the original finish, which was a faux finish, and it was made to look like a more expensive wood by applying a grain. They would use feathers to make these uh, different intricate patterns in the wood. Now we're going to move on to the next room. The Elijah Cobb House was known as one of the best examples on Cape Cod of late Georgian architecture. You wouldn't necessarily know it by looking at this room. This could have been a children's room, and as we talked about the expense put into the master chamber and the best parlor downstairs, you would see very little effort was put into uh, decoration, intricate molding in this room. It's very bare bones. This room we call the Four Seasons of Fun, how Brewster used to play. And we start in the winter with some of the winter clothing that a small child would have worn and a pair of snowshoes and we work our way around past the rocking horse, which I'm sure got a lot of use in the cold winter months, to the other things that might happen in the winter, doll houses and dolls. We're gonna pause here for one second and look at this wonderful photo as we creep into the summer months. Here we are out behind the Cobb House playing croquet. And this is the outbuilding at Cobb House as it looked back at the turn of the last century. The, the bay on the left there was the carriage shed originally and now they seem to be using it to store firewood. Later this uh, shed was turned into a guest house when um, Mrs. Dugan ended up needing some income and started renting rooms to boarders. This is a picture of the beach house and Cobb did have his own beach house on the property which of course was very popular with the boarders. And we have a beautiful display here of summer. Imagine having to wear this to the beach and this was considered scanty clothing. We have a lovely picture of unknown people. So if anyone recognizes anybody, give us a call. We still do not know who the people are in that photograph. Here we have lots of the games that you would have played as we creep back into the cold fall months. Many of these games are still so popular today. We have Parcheesi and Backgammon. And little did you know, Tiddlywinks was the hot game in 1890. There was a whole Tiddlywinks craze going on. And here we're creeping back around to the winter sports. We have skates and some fishing equipment. Ice fishing was very popular in Brewster and most popular on Cobb's Pond. This 1858 map is known as the Walling Map. It was based on a survey he did in 1858 of Barnstable County and Nantucket and Dukes counties. Brewster is marked with a flag in case you forget where you are from all your travels around Cape Cod. Look at that beautiful fishing reel and more skates. Now here we have a slideshow. As I mentioned earlier, Caro Dugan was a protege of uh, the photographer Cornelius Chenery, and she took over 400 images of Brewster at the turn of the last century. All of those images are here on a continuously running slideshow. If you'd like to see a good collection of those photographs, go to our website. We have two exhibits of these photographs online, Brewster in black and white and the faces of Brewster. The Faces of Brewster exhibit is actually also on display at the town offices. The Brewster Historical Society purchased this old post office from East Brewster at auction and we have so much fun when the children come in to visit, or adults, either one is welcome. We offer you these free postcards. This one is of the Cobb House attic. You can imagine how much fun the child would have had having a little tea party upstairs in the attic. You address the postcard and you mail it. And compliments of the Brewster Historical Society, we will stamp it and put it in the real mail for you. In this case, we have some more toys, musical instruments, china dolls, doll combs and brushes, and some, a collection of paper dolls. We are particularly grateful to the Eddy sisters here at the Brewster Historical Society. They've helped out over many years with a fund devoted towards uh, preserving Brewster's history. And this photo is a lovely portrait of the three Eddy sisters at play. That concludes the part of the Cobb House that's open to the general public. There are two more rooms behind me that are similar to the two rooms we've just showed you in the front. Those are kept for Brewster Historical Society's offices and our print center and they are not open to the public. There is one room that's the research room and it has been maintained in its historic state 
and it is available for researchers when they need to access some of our collections. In between the two main rooms is a small room that was the servants' quarters. And we've used that room now for our print room and our computer and all that fun modern technology. Those rooms were already ruined in the 1940s when they were turned into modern bathrooms. When the house was originally purchased in 1945 from the Cobb family, there was a six-hole outhouse out back and no interior plumbing. This is an 1875, what they call the Democrat carriage, and it's a wonderful acquisition for the Cobb House Museum. And this is where I'm gonna say goodbye as I hit the road to visit some of my neighbors.